Hey everybody, um, this is the chapter five video. So if you haven't read chapter four, go on back and watch or listen to that video first. Um, I don't have great lighting in my living room and so uh, I'm doing this on Sunday night. So I'm gonna read as fast as I can uh, because I will be enshrouded in darkness here soon. Um, so remember at the end of chapter four, we had Scout being kind of nervous that she doesn't really want to play the Radley game that Jem has decided they're going to play all summer. She's uncomfortable with it. She has more reason to be uncomfortable with it than what she's saying out loud. But we've got this new conflict developing for Scout, and this may or may not be a question later in the week on your study got questions. Um, but we see this conflict of Scout's femininity kind of playing a play, play, playing a role in what used to just be them all on the same playing field. So in previous chapters, um, Scout, Jem, and Dill would all play together like it ain't no thing. But, and also I know that's a double negative, just like it was no big deal. Um, but now there's this divide beginning where uh, every, every time Scout's like afraid or like doesn't agree with what Jem's saying, she's being a scary little girl. It's not you're just being scared, it's you're being a girl. And that's uh, the connotation of that word girl is not positive. So you wanna start paying attention to that. So we're gonna start on chapter five in this book it's gonna be page 46. My nagging got the better of Jem eventually, me nagging to stop the game. As I knew it would, and to my relief, we slowed down the game for a while. He still maintained, however, that Atticus hadn't said we couldn't, therefore we could, and if Atticus ever said we couldn't, Jem had thought of a way around it. He would simply change the names of the characters, and then we couldn't be accused of playing anything. Dill was in hearty agreement with this plan of action, Still, it becomes something of a trial anyway, following Jem about. He asked me earlier in the summer to marry him. Then he promptly forgot about it. He had staked me out, marked me as his property, said I was the only girl he would ever love. Then he neglected me. I beat him up twice, but it did no good. He only grew closer to Jem. They spent days together in the treehouse plotting and planning, calling me only when they needed a third party. But I kept aloof for their more foolhardy schemes for a while, and on the pain of being called a girl, spent most of the remaining twilights that summer sitting with Miss Maudie Atkinson on her front porch. So, um, everybody always asks, like, what? Dill asked him, her to marry him? Um, this is going to be like just that, like, naive, childlike, you know, like, if you ever had a neighbor that you had a crush on, people would say, like, oh, they'll get married someday. Like, very casual, no nothing actually um, official about it. Um, do you love too that Scout's um, attempt at mending the relationship was to beat him up twice? Jem and I had always enjoyed our free run of Miss Maudie's yard if we kept out of her azaleas, but our contact with her was not clearly defined. Until Jem and Dill excluded me from their plans, she was only another lady in the neighborhood, but a relatively benign presence. Benign means like not evil, very um, Sorry, I didn't want to just say um, um a bunch of times, so I wanted to think of my word before I forced you guys to listen to me think um, for another few seconds. So um, benign is going to mean like uh, not causing any harm. Our tacit, which means unspoken, treaty with Miss Maudie was that we could plan our lawn, eat our scupper nogs, remember from chapter four, that's a fancy word for grapes, if we didn't jump on the arbor and explore her vast back lot, terms so generous we seldom spoke to her, so careful were we to preserve the delicate balance of our relationship. But Del, Dil, blah, 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 Jem and Dill drove me closer to her with their behavior. Miss Maudie hated her house. Time spent indoors was time wasted. She was a widow, a chameleon lady who worked in her flower beds in an old straw hat and men's coveralls, but after five her five o'clock bath, she would appear on the porch and reign over the street in magisterial beauty. She loved everything that grew in God's earth, even the weeds, with one exception. If she found a blade of nutgrass in her yard, sorry, maybe's barking. Sorry about that. Maybe was letting me know she was ready for her evening snack. Um, so now she's good. Top of 47. 
Miss Maudie hated her house. I know I read this, but just to read it one more time. Time spent indoors was time wasted. She was a widow, a chameleon lady who worked in her flower beds in an old straw hat and men's coveralls. But after her five o'clock bath, she would appear on the porch and reign over the street in magisterial beauty. She loved everything that grew in God's earth, even the weeds, with one exception. If she found a blade of nut grass in her yard, it was like the second battle of the Marne. She swooped down upon with a tin t upon it with a tin tub and subjected it to blasts from beneath with a poisonous substance she said was so powerful it'd kill us all if we didn't stand out of the way. Why can't you just pull it up, I asked after witnessing a prolonged campaign against a blade not three inches high. Pull it up, child, pull it up. She picked up the limp sprout and squeezed her thumb up its tiny stalk. Microscopic grains oozed out. Well, one sprig of nutgrass can ruin a whole yard. Look here. When it comes fall, this dries up and the wind blows it all over Maycomb County. Miss Maudie's face likened such to an occurrence and such an occurrence unto an Old Testament pestilence. So like she was likening it to be like one of the Old Testament uh, from the Bible, one of the plagues. Her speech was crisp for a Maycomb County inhabitant. She called us all by our names, and when she grinned, she revealed two minute, small, gold prongs clipped to her eye teeth. When I admired them and hoped I would have some someday, she said, look here. With a click of her, that was my impression, a click of her tongue, she thrust out her bridge work, a gesture of cordiality that cemented our friendship. So Scott wants a pair of fake teeth like Miss Maudie, and Miss Maudie popped them out for her. Miss Maudie's benevolence, kindness, instead extended to Jim, Jem and Dill whenever they paused in their pursuits. We reaped the benefits of a talent Miss Maudie had hitherto kept hidden from us. She made the best cakes in the neighborhood. When she was admitted into our confidence, every time she baked, she made a big cake and three little ones, and she would call across the street, Jem Finch, Scout Finch, Charles Baker Harris, come here. Our promptness, promptness was always rewarded. In summertime, twilights are long and peaceful. Often as not, Miss Maudie and I would sit silently on her porch, watching the sky go from yellow to pink as the sun went down, watching flights of martins, birds, sweep low over the neighborhood and disappear behind the schoolhouse rooftops. Miss Maudie, I said one evening, you think Brew Radley's still alive? His name's Arthur and he's alive, she said. She was rocking slowly in, in her big oak chair. Do you smell my mimosa? It's like angel's breath this evening. Mimosa, mimosa in this case is a type of flower. Yes, um, how do you know? You know what, child? That b Mr. Arthur is still alive. What a morbid question, but I suppose it's a morbid subject. I know he's alive, Jean Louise, because I haven't seen him carried out yet. Maybe he died and they stuffed him up the chimney. Where did you get such a notion? what Jem said they thought they did. <sighs> he gets more like Jack Finch every day. Miss Maudie had known Uncle Jack Finch, Atticus's brother, since they were children. Nearly the same age they had grown up together at Finch's Landing. Miss Maudie was the daughter of a neighboring landowner, Miss Dr. Frank Buford. Dr. Buford's profession was medicine, and his obsession was anything that grew in the ground, so he stayed poor. So he was a doctor by profession, but his biggest interest was like his yard and planting flowers and stuff, so he never did a great business as a doctor. Uncle Jack Finch confined his passion for digging to his window boxes in Nashville and stayed rich. We saw Uncle Jack every Christmas, and every Christmas he yelled across the street for Miss Maudie to come marry him. Miss Maudie would yell back, Call a little louder, Jack Finch. They'll hear you at the post office. I haven't heard you yet. Jem and I thought this a strange way to ask for a lady's hand in marriage. But then, Uncle Jack was rather strange. He said he was trying to get Miss Got Maudie's goat that he'd been trying unsuccessfully for 40 years and that he was the last person in the world Miss Maudie would think about marrying but the first person she thought about teasing and the best offense to her was spirited offense, all of which we understood clearly. Arthur Radley just stays in the house, that's all, said Miss Maudie. Wouldn't you stay in the house if you didn't want to come out? Yes, am but I'd want to come out. Why doesn't he? Miss Maudie's eyes narrowed. You know that story as well as I do. I never heard why, though. Nobody ever told me why. Miss Maudie settled her bridge work. You know old Mr. Radley was a foot-washing Baptist. Now stay tuned. My lesson for this uh, chapter um, will explain this part more. So I'm going to read straight through it, but I will explain it on, um, when the, um, I guess, Tuesday, on Tuesday's lesson. 
Miss Maudie settled her bridge work. You know old Mr. Radley was a foot-washing Baptist. That's what you are, ain't it? My shell's not that hard, child. I'm just a Baptist. Don't y'all believe in foot-washing? We do. At home. In the bathtub. But we can't have communion with y'all. Apparently deciding that it was easier to define primitive baptistry than close communion, Miss Maudie said, Foot-washers believe anything that's pleasure is a sin. Do you know if some of them come out of the woods one Saturday and passed by this place and told me that me and my flowers were going to hell? Your flowers too? Yes, ma'am, they'd burn right with me. They thought I spent too much time in God's outdoors and not enough time inside the house reading the, the Bible. My confidence in pulpit gospel lessened at the vision of Miss Maudie stewing forever in various Protestant hells. True enough, she had an acid tongue in her head and she did not go about the neighborhood doing good as Miss Stephanie Crawford. But while no one with a grain of sense trusted Miss Stephanie, Jem and I had considerable faith in Miss Maudie. She had never told on us, had never played cat and mouse with us. She was not at all interested in our private lives. She was our friend. How so reasonable a creature could live in peril of everlasting torment was incomprehensible. That ain't right, Miss Maudie. You're the best lady I know. Miss Maudie grinned. Thank you, ma'am. Thing is, foot washers think women are a sin by definition. They take the Bible literally, you know. Is that why Mr. Arthur stays in the house to keep away from the women? I have no idea. Doesn't make sense to me. Looks like if Mr. Arthur was hankering after heaven, he'd come out on the porch at least. Attica said, God's loving fo folks like you love yourself. Miss Maudie stopped rocking, and her voice hardened. You're too young to understand this, she said, but sometimes, this is a very important quote that we will discuss tomorrow or on Tuesday. But sometimes the Bible in the hand of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hand of, oh, your father. I was shocked. Atticus doesn't drink whiskey, I said. He never drank a drop in his life. No, he did. He said he drank some one time and didn't like it. Miss Maudie laughed. Wasn't talking about your father, she said. What I meant was, if Atticus Finch drank until he was drunk, he wouldn't be as hard as some men who were at their best. There are just some kind of men who who are so busy worrying about the next world that they've never learned to live in this one. And you can look down the, st the street and see the results. Do you think if they're true, all those things they say about B Mr. Arthur? What things? I told her. That is three full fourths colored folks and one fourth Stephanie Crawford, said Miss Maudie grimly. Remember we talked about this earlier. They use the word colored uh, in this book. It is not a word we use anymore. Um, because uh, it's not uh, appropriate. It has uh, connotations that are connected to segregation. Um, and so you hear that word in here, but you never want to use that as a, a part of your answer unless you're directly quoting the text. Stephanie Crawford even told me once she woke up in the middle of the night and found him looking in the window at her. I said, what'd you do, Stephanie? Move over in bed and make room for him? That shut her up a while. I was sure it did. Miss Maudie's voice was enough to shut anybody up. No, child, she said. That is a sad house. I remember Arthur Radley when he was a boy. He always spoke nicely to me no matter what folks said he did. Spoke as no nicely as he knew how. You reckon he's crazy? Miss Maudie shook her head. If he's not, he should be by now. Things that happen to people we never really know. What happens in houses, behind closed doors, what secrets. Atticus, don't ever do anything to Jem and me in the house they don't do in the yard, I said, feeling it my duty to defend my parent. Gracious child, I was raveling a thread, wasn't even thinking about your father, but now that I am, I'll say this. Atticus Finch is the same in the house as he is on the public streets. How'd you like some fresh pound cake to take home? I liked it very much. Next morning when I awakened, I found Jem and Dill in the backyard, deep in conversation. When I joined them, as usual, they said, go away. Well, not. This yard's as much mine as it is yours, Jem Finch. I got just as much right to play in it as you have. Dill and Jem emerged from a brief huddle. You say you've, if you stay, you've got to do what we tell you, Dill warned. Well, I said, who's so high and mighty all of a sudden? If you don't say you'll do what we tell you, we ain't going to tell you anything, Dill continued. You act like you grew ten inches overnight. All right, what is it? Jem said placidly, which means very calmly. We're going to give a note to Boo Radley. Just how? 
I was trying to fight down the automatic terror rising in me. It was all right for Miss Maudie to talk. She was old and snug on her porch. It was different for us. Jem was merely going to put a note at the end of a fishing pole and stick it through the shutters. If anyone came along, Dill would ring the bell. Dill raised his right hand. In it was my mother's silver dinner bell. I'm going around the side of the house, said Jem. We looked yesterday from across the street and there's a shutter loose, thinking maybe we could stick it in the windowsill at least. Jem, now you're in it. You can't get out of it. You'll just stay in it, Miss Pris. Okay, okay, but I don't want to watch, Jem. Somebody was... Yes, you will. You'll watch the back end of the lot, and Dill's going to watch the front of the house and up the street, and if anybody comes, he'll ring the bell. That clear? All right, then. What to ride him? Dill said, we're asking him real politely to come out sometimes and tell us what he does in there. We said we wouldn't hurt him, and we'd buy him an ice cream. Y'all gone crazy. He'll kill us. Dill said, it's my idea. I'll, I figure if he'd come out and sit a spell with us, he might feel better. How do you know he don't feel good? Well, how do you feel if you've been shut up for a hundred years with nothing but cats to eat? I bet he's got a beard down to here. Like your daddy's? He ain't got a beard. He... Dill stopped as if trying to remember. Uh-huh. Gotcha. I said, you said before you were on the off the train good, your daddy had a black beard. If it's all the same to you, he shaved it off last summer. Yeah, and I've got the letter to prove it. He sent me two dollars, too. Keep on. I reckon even sent you a mounted police uniform. That never showed up, did it? You just keep telling him, son. Dill Harris could tell the biggest lies I ever heard. Among other things, he had been up in a mail plane 17 times. He had been to Nova Scotia. He had seen an elephant, and his granddaddy was Brigadier General Joe Wheeler and left him his sword. So we're starting to see that Dill has a, a, a little bit of a habit to fib. And we'll get back to that in terms of, of his character later. Y'all hush, said Jem. He scuttled beneath the house and came out with a yellow bamboo pole. Reckon this is long enough to reach from the sidewalk? Anybody who's brave enough to go up and touch the house hadn't, hadn't ought to use a fishing pole, I said. Why don't you just knock on the front door? This is different, said Jem. How many times do I have to tell you that? Dill took a piece of paper from his pocket and gave it to Jem. The three of us walked cautiously toward the old house. Dill remained at the light pole on the front center of the lot, and Jem and I edged down the sidewalk parallel to the side of the house. I walked beyond Jem and stood where I could not see around the curve. All clear, I said. Not a soul in sight. Jem looked up the sidewalk to Dill, who nodded. Jem attached the note to the end of a fishing pole, let the pole out across the yard, and pushed it toward the window he had selected. The pole lacked several inches of being long enough, and Jem leaned over as far as he could. I watched him making jabbing motions for so long I abandoned my post and went to him. Can't get it off the pole, he muttered. Or if I get it off, I can't make it stay. Go on back down the street, Scout. I returned and gazed around the curve at the empty road. Occasionally, I looked back at Jem, who was patiently trying to place the note on the windowsill. It would flutter to the ground, and Jem would jab it up, till I thought if Boo Radley ever received it, he wouldn't be able to read it. I was looking down the street when the dinner bell rang. Shoulder up, I reeled around to face Boo Radley and his bloody fangs. Instead, I saw Dill ringing the bell with all his might in Atticus's face. Jem looked so awful, I didn't have the heart to tell him I told him so. He trudged along, dragging the pole behind him on the sidewalk. Atticus said, stop ringing that bell. Dill grabbed the clapper and in it, in the silence that followed, I wished he'd start ringing it again. Atticus pushed his hat to the back of his head and put his hands on his hips. Jem, he said, what were you doing? Nothing, sir. I don't want any of that. Tell me. I was... We were just trying to give something to Mr. Radley. What were you trying to give him? Just a letter. Let me see it. Jem held out a filthy piece of paper. Atticus took it and tried to read it. What do you want Mr. Why do you want Mr. Radley to come out? Dill said, we thought he might enjoy us, and dried up when Atticus looked at him. Son, he said to Jem, I'm going to tell you something and tell you one time. Stop tormenting that man. That goes for the other two of you. And this, this paragraph here is going to be like Scout recounting the things that Atticus said on their walk home together. What Mr. Radley did was his own business. If he wanted to come out, he would. If he wanted to stay inside his own house, he had the right to stay inside, free from the attentions of inquisitive children, which was a mild term for the likes of us. How would we like if Atticus, 
Atticus barged on, in, on us without knocking when we were in our rooms at night. We were, in effect, doing the same thing to Mr. Radley. What Mr. Radley did might seem peculiar to us, but it did not seem peculiar to him. Furthermore, had it ever occurred to us that the civil way to communicate with another being was by the front door instead of the side window? Lastly, we were to stay away from that house until we were invited there. We were not to play an asinine game, which is one of my favorite adjectives. That asinine game you'd seen us playing or make fun of anybody on this street or in this town. We weren't making fun of him. We weren't laughing at him, said Jem. We were just, so that was what you were doing, wasn't it? So remember, Jem said that's not what they were playing, and now he just admitted that they were playing it but not making fun of him. So Atticus caught him. Making fun of him? No, said Atticus, putting his said Atticus, putting his life's history on display for the edification of the neighborhood. Edification is like the, the lesson or the education. Jem seemed to swell a little. I didn't say we were doing that. I didn't say it. Jem grin, or Atticus grinned dryly. You just told me, he said. You stop this nonsense right now, each and every one of you. Jem gaped at him. You want to be a lawyer, don't you? Our father's mouth was suspiciously firm as if he were trying to hold it in a line. Jem decided there was no point in quibbling and was silent. When Atticus went inside the house to retrieve a file he'd forgotten to take to work that morning, Jem finally realized he had been done in by the oldest lawyer's trick on record, getting him to confess. He waited a respectful distance from the front steps, watched Atticus leave the house, and walked toward town. When Atticus was out of earshot, Jem yelled after him. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but I ain't so sure now. See you later for Chapter 6.